appreciate so much our opportunity again tonight that the Lord has spared us, that we can worship Him. Thankful for your presence. If you have your New Testament, if you'll turn with me to the book of Matthew in the 19th chapter, I want to read a few verses for the thought of our study. Matthew chapter 19. Let's begin reading at verse 16, and we'll read down through verse 22. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Throughout the years, I'm sure that you have heard many different lessons concerning this young man. And I'm sure that you've heard it portrayed in many different ways. And yet tonight, I'm not ashamed to go back and to examine what the Bible has to say about who we identify as the rich young ruler. And at this time, I have one particular lesson I want to put into your mind and my mind. And I want us to look at how to get a moral man to obey the truth. And I want to know this evening, how can a moral man ever obey the truth? You know, many times we have in our mind who a good prospect would be. And we have in our mind that this individual is already moral. This individual already obtains many of the same interests we have, and thus we call them a good prospect. And yet, my friend, you'll find that many times, individuals who have already good morals are often very difficult to convert. I'm not saying it's any more difficult to convert a man as maybe one who's practicing living in sin, but I want us to understand that many times we think they'd fit right in and yet they still need to see their sin and to repent and to obey the gospel. And many times because they're all moral, they do not see that need. I want to talk about this man and we'll look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke and we'll rehash some things about this individual. The first thing I want us to remember as we study the synoptic gospels is that he was a ruler. He was a man who had authority. When you take your Bible and you look in the book of Luke in the 18th chapter, you'll find it says in verse 18, a certain ruler came. But when you read Mark's account, you'll find he didn't just come. Mark says in Mark 10, he ran to Jesus and knelt before him. I find that a I find that here was a man who had authority, a man who was probably dignified and respected in the community, but when he saw Jesus, he did something that was not dignified in that time and place. He ran. Men would wear long gowns, and to run, you'd have to pick up the gown a little bit, and that was not considered dignified. Then he knelt before Jesus. He was used to having others kneel before him because of his authority, but he recognized Jesus had authority. So when I read about that man, I see some things that are outstanding. I see that he was a man who was a ruler, and it's amazing to read the scholars what they say, that he must have had some type of political power. I've been more inclined to believe he was a ruler of the Jewish religion. But whatever way you want to look at it, he had authority. But then if you take your Bible, look again in the Gospel of Luke in the 18th chapter. And look, if you will, at verse 23. In verse 23, notice the last line, he was very rich. Not only was he an individual that had authority, not only was he a ruler of subtype, he was a wealth. He was a man who had riches. And in the account given, you observe that this man was wealthy. But I want to stop for just a moment. 
I want you to observe, that's not a sin. I've had some preachers almost get up and act like if somebody has money, that's a sin. No, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Loving money is the sin. But I'll tell you, some people can work and obtain wealth and be kind and generous and share it. And I've seen individuals who had all kinds of money and you wouldn't know it because they were generous with what they had. They didn't try to flaunt what they had. And they were individuals who did not try to love money, but they loved God. It's one thing to be wealthy. It's another thing to love wealth. And I don't tell you, you can love a dime just as much as you can a million dollars. And I've seen some people who are stingy over a dime as much as they would be over a million dollars. But I want you to notice a third thing. He had morals. And I think we would all agree that he had morals and that he was sincere when he said he kept the, mo- uh, the commandments. When he came to Jesus, he said, look, all the commandments you've listed. He said, I am one who keeps the law of Moses. I keep what Moses has said. I do that which the commandments have been told to me. I've kept them since the days of my youth. When my mother and ta- father taught me the commandments upon their I said, those are things I will keep. And so here was a young man who had in his mind, he was moral. But I'll tell you something else. He had a desire for eternal life. I find that just fascinating. He's a young man. Many young people, the last thing on their mind is eternal life. The last thing they're thinking about is that one day they'll die. But this young man, though he had wealth, And though he had authority, he was concerned more about eternal life than those things at that particular time. But I want you to read again in Mark's account in Mark 10. Notice that Jesus looked at him. And the Bible says Jesus loved him. I like that statement. Jesus loved that man's soul. But Jesus isn't going to tell him, you're okay. I'll tell you what a lot of my brethren would do right there. They'd wink at him and say, you know, you'd make a good song leader for us. If you would come down and just be baptized and just walk around, you're already moral. And if you would you'd come over here to O'Neill, you'd fit right in with us. you got money, you like the same things we like, you'd fit right in. And I'll tell you, my friend, that's not how you convert people. That man had a problem. He was still in his sin. And many times we try to flatter people into the kingdom of God instead of bringing them to repentance. If someone comes down the aisle and winks at the preacher thinking he's doing the preacher a favor by placing membership here, but he's not going to be baptized, he can't place membership anyway. He's not in Christ. And if he comes forward and he thinks, well, I'm just going to do them a favor by being here, then he misunderstands the kingdom of God in the first place. And I'm fearful we sometimes left that impression. Now you say, now Mike, you're going to run people off. I'm not trying to run any pity off. But have you ever noticed Jesus gave him a decision? Jesus said, if you want to do what's right, go sell what you have. I'm almost convinced if the man would have turned around to go sell what he'd have, Jesus would say, I see you don't love me. Jesus knew what his heart was. Jesus could read the hearts of men. And so when Jesus knew what you have, he knew what that man's problem was. He loved his riches more than he did eternal life. Now, I want to take that, and from this brief view of this man, I want to draw several lessons, and I think they're important to us. Number one, we need to see the danger of being self-deceived. Remember, the man said, I've kept these things from the days of my youth, and there's no doubt he thought he had. He felt he was right with God. But you know, my friend, others thought the same thing. In Acts 23, 1, you remember when Paul stood before the high priest? Paul said, I've lived with a clear conscience unto this day. How could Paul say that? Paul said, when I lived in my past, I thought I was doing right, even though I was doing wrong. I think Cornelius made... There were some things that he had learned that perhaps weren't right. And he had to change. And this brings to our mind the passage from Proverbs 14. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is destruction. This is the danger for so many people today. They're good, upright, moral people, but they've been deceived about their condition. 
My friend, our morals will not save us. Only if we are baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, have been raised up out of that grave, or follow faithfully the Son of God, walking in His steps, living diligently for it, then we can say that we know our soul is well with God. People have almost got themselves to believe, I'm a good enough person. Why would God cast me into hell? My friend, when God comes back, He's not coming back for good people. He's coming back for His people. He's coming back for those who claim to be Christians, those who walk in His footsteps. And I've come to find out in life that many times people who are moral and upright and do a lot of good things have figured that they'll be saved by just what they've done. What the Bible says. Secondly, have you ever thought about how wrong God can be? We've noticed the danger of self-deceit, but have you ever thought about how wrong one can be? Here you see an individual who thought he was good and moral, but he could have been wrong. He was wrong. He had something in his heart that was taking him away from God. And I'll tell you, anything in our heart that takes us away from God needs to be extracted and thrown away. Jesus said in Matthew, He said, if you're right, causes you to stumble, cut it off. He said there's nothing that is worth losing your soul over. If there's a part of you that is keeping you from doing what you ought to do, he said pluck out your eye and cast it from you. And so many times we have convinced ourselves that we are living right when we're living wrong and we've been self-deceived. But if we would honestly look at ourselves, and I want to tell you, that's painful to see who really are, what our motives are, why we do what we do, then many of us would be able to say like Paul in 1 Timothy 1.15, I am the chief of sinners. You, my friends, I'm going to say this with kindness and yet with all candor. We can dress up good. And I think most of us understand what it takes to look good in society. And even when some people are ungodly, we still know what it means to walk with more. We know what it means to have integrity, but the problem isn't just morality and integrity. The problem is a heart that is right with God needs to be made sure it's right with God. I've often thought about Cornelius. He thought he was right with God. That's why God sent Peter to tell him what he needed to do. And my friend, here's the danger of a moral man finding the truth. It can feel right and wrong. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of religions that need to look at that. And we need to examine the Scripture to make sure that we are following what God has said and not what man has said. It can feel right, but it can be wrong. But here's the problem with that man. I read this statement, and I think how true it is. He was good enough to deceive himself and bad enough to deceive himself. His soul was in jeopardy. His soul stood condemned and damned and lost, and yet he had convinced himself that he was a good man. I think the young man may have thought Jesus would be impressed with him. Look at me. I'm a ruler. I'm young. I'm rich. And I still come to you. And Jesus wasn't impressed with his riches. And Jesus didn't flatter him and say, you know you'd make a good 13th apostle, just join the crowd. Jesus said, you've got some changing to do. You know, that's hard for us to hear. Because there's some of us who've been Christians for years, and yet we've allowed the world to sink back into our lives, and we're allowing the things of this world to seep again and again. And before long, if we don't take self-inventory, we're going to be back in the world and be deceiving ourselves that because we come to O'Neill on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and sometimes on Wednesday, that means we're fine. I'll tell you, that's not right. Walking Christ is a daily thing. But that brings up something else. I think about this man being a seeker. And I thought about a danger in this moral man that we can apply to us here at O'Neill. Let's just say that this man visited here and he filled out a visitor card with his information and said, here's his desire. How high would we rank him? Some of them would say, oh, I know that man. He knows the bankers in town. He knows everything. I'll tell you, we need to get that man. 
Don't tell me that doesn't cross some people's mind because I've been places where they've told me, don't preach, that person gives a lot. And I'll tell you something, my friend. If I don't preach, I ain't worth my salt, much less a salary as a preacher if I don't preach the truth, no matter who it is. But I'll tell you something else. We'd say, he meets a lot of our criteria. He's a lot like us. He has some of the same interests we have. We would rank him high. He fits in middle class society or upper middle class society. He might even be upper class. He would really fit in here. And so we would rank him high. But here comes in a drunkard or someone who's tattooed from head to toe and who's had a checkered past and we'd say, they wouldn't fit in here. I'll tell you, they fit in here just as much as the other man. And if he doesn't, this church isn't right. We need to understand this with all my heart. I want this into our hearts. People, we are all sinners who need Christ. And so many times we have an idea of what the prospect is. The prospect is any sinner. What makes you think you were more eligible and more qualified for the gospel than the man who's a drunkard in the alley? You're not. You're not any better than that man. I'll never forget when I was a child. My mother would take in foster children and some of them would come in would have bugs. And some of them came in with broken bones. And I remember one day we drove by a certain part of town and I looked out and I just said, look how dirty it is. And my mother looked at me and she said, I want you to remember one thing, son. Don't remember, for, she said, remember where these children came from, but don't forget where they can go. Don't forget they can change. And they're no different than you. In 1 Corinthians 6, have you ever noticed the ones that were converted? In Acts 18, 8, Paul talked about Crispus being converted, and then he talked about Corinthians being converted. But in 1 Corinthians 6, look at the ones that were converted. He said in verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. That's the secret right there. He says, don't think it's just the moral man who's already living more than me. He said, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And I could see a lot of the religious people saying, that's right. And I could see a lot of moral people saying, that's right. But look at what Paul says in the next verse. Were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now let's go back to the car. If someone comes in and says, I need help, do we look around and say, oh no. That means that's going to be a lot of time invested. Oh no, we'll have to work with this individual. Oh no, he may not fit in. There's danger. In people. There's a danger of thinking you're better than somebody else. And can I say with all kindness and all candor, and yet with love in my heart, if you think you're better than someone else, you're already standing on dangerous ground. Your soul is in danger. Because Jesus didn't just come to die. Jesus came to die for every one of us. And the next time you look out and you see somebody, and they just look and you just say, Oh, Look at that person. I tell you what you say. There go I by the grace of God. And you give them a hand. And you tell them the truth. And you tell them they can change their life. Because then we need to think of one last thing. The danger of loving something more than God. That was the... And you want to know why many will walk out tonight? Because they love something more than God. Their heart. I don't know what it may be, but there's something that means more to them than their relationship with God. And think of the great price that man paid. He could have had eternal life, but he rejected Christ. Can you think about what in this world is worth more than eternal life? I haven't found a thing. 
my mother was dying, and she called me to her back room. And she was showing me some of her furniture, and she said, I want you to look at that. And then she looked at me, and she said, you know what that is, Mike? She called me Michael. She didn't like me to be called Mike. Michael, you know what that is? I said, what? Just something else to dust. I'll tell you. I think a lot of us need to look inside and see where our heart is. Do we think we're going to go to heaven just because we're moral, but we've not submitted to Christ? Nope. Do we think that we are superior to somebody else and that God will like us because we don't do some of these things? That Nope. Paul was a murderer. David was an adulterer. Noah was a drunkard. And I'll tell you what all of them did. They all made the heroes of faith. Why? Because they changed their life. And sometimes what it takes is some of us to see how far we've really gone from God. And I'll tell you, young men and young ladies, you may be going to Athens Bible School. Good for you. That doesn't mean you got your ticket punched to heaven. You may go on to a college, and that college teaches Bible. Good for you. That doesn't mean your ticket's punched to heaven. You may say, I don't associate with the world. Ah, there's the problem. There's a difference between being part of the world and trying to convince the world who they need. See, we can't live in a bubble. You're going to have to meet people who aren't children of God. And we have a responsibility of letting our light shine so they can see what they can have in Christ. Oh, I would. I had the ability to preach that the way I wanted to. I'm sorry I woke some of you up earlier. But my prayer is that you will think about, am I just a moral person or am I a Christian? Jesus, who are you coming back for? I'm coming back for my people who wear my name. If you're not here and you need to open the gospel, we pray you come.